So let's get started with the seven churches, and this is the church at Sardis, and this marks church number five of seven. We will have uh, the next couple of meetings. We'll try to bring this to a conclusion, and each month I am faced with the same challenge, and that is how can you squeeze into one little sermon all of the information that needs to be said, and so the answer is what it's been every month. You can't. I won't be able to do it. And so some things get more attention than other things. Some moments in the verses get a real deep dive, and some moments don't get much of a dive at all. And how, how can we expect anything other than that unless we're going to do weeks and weeks and weeks or months and months on each church? Can't do that. Um, instead, what we do is pick two or three things in that that really jump out at me. And I want to give you a heads up. At the end of this segment, will be a little section on the book, the Lamb's Book of Life, that heavenly book that names we've all been told are written in when we get saved. And uh, we're going to take a look at that because this is a passage in Revelation that talks about that. It's not the only passage in Revelation. But we're going to do a move backwards through the Bible look at the end of this lesson. I'm saying this up front for those who maybe are watching or listening to this, and they know that's in this segment. Uh, we are going to do that. That is going to be one of the highlights of, of this sermon. However, it, I don't think it really speaks to the church at Sardis. And the point of this series is the churches. It's in that, but it doesn't really inform that church directly. So I'm saying all that so that when we get there, you'll realize we're covering it because it's an important moment. But I don't think it, it's the moment that's, that is the message to Sardis, okay? Um, we'll use it as a, as a People can use it as a study key and we'll go through the verses and look at it and, and wrestle it out for themselves. All right. So let's focus on the church at Sardis. And we do so by reading the first verse of Revelation chapter 3. We make the turn from 2 into 3. The first four churches are in chapter 2. The final three churches are in chapter 3. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, these things say he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars... I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Uh, I hope I haven't been saying the church at Smyrna. Uh, okay, I, that happens to me as I study these out. I'll go, oh, I'm going to be on Sardis, and then I'll start wrestling with Smyrna and go, wait, just because it starts with an S doesn't mean I knew it started with an S, though. Um, so it's Sardis. Um, just, I had that little flashing thought in my mind that went, I don't think you said Sardis a minute ago. Good to know that I did. I shouldn't have said that. No one would have ever known that I was dealing with that. <laughs> But that's the truth. That's exactly what I was dealing with, which is, I hope I just said the right church. Okay, we did. Sardis. Um, the, the message comes forth to them in much the same way it comes forth to the other churches. In that, we get another glimpse of Jesus. It's not a new glimpse of Jesus. It's a repeated glimpse from the first chapter. We're going to dip back into the first chapter a little bit in this journey today. But what we're seeing in each church is the, it's as if the spotlight, we saw Jesus out, out of the gate in the book and boom, look at this. And there's all this imagery about him from his head to his feet, literally, from the way his hair looks to the way his feet looks, his eyes, the sword coming out of his mouth, what he's wearing. And then it moves away and the letter unfolds to each church. And then at the top of each church, it's like the spotlight jumps back on Jesus a little bit to show another angle of Jesus as if, as Time unfolds, the church, one of the things the church can expect is ongoing beautiful revelations of the Lord Jesus. Not new revelations, not like a, a church 200 years from now or a thousand years from now is going to know, is going to have a revelation of Jesus that hasn't been revealed uh, in the Christ of the scriptures, but that the light will shine on it in a way that hopefully each generation will experience Christ anew. They will not experience a new Christ, but they'll experience Christ anew. And that's part of the beauty of the apocalypse. The unveiling is that the spotlight shines on one thing. And then for the next church age, the spotlight shines on another thing. But it's all Jesus. And it's interesting how we do need renewals of certain parts of the ministries of Jesus. We've had those happen through the generations where certain parts of his ministry were, were in deeper focus than others. And that, I think, is part of the natural evolution of things when it comes to learning who he is through the book of Revelation. However, here's something that, that I really want to point out for this week. Revelation does not allow us to see Jesus apart from his church. So there is no revelation of Jesus that doesn't include him walking among those seven golden candlesticks. He's always the head of a body. The body is the body of Christ, and Christ is always the head. 
And we are always the menorah to the world. And what I mean by that is we see Jesus in Revelation 1 walking among the seven golden candlesticks. And then every time a new church comes into the scene, Ephesus, Smyrna, Thyatira, whatever it is, here comes Jesus again, right out the, at the front with the spotlight on a different part of him. Spotlight on a different, what's happening? Jesus who walks among his seven lampstands, always walks among his church. And note, the church is the lampstand. The church are those candlesticks. And so the church is the menorah. The church is the light that shines to the world. Where's Jesus in his church? Always in his church. Even when his church is Sardis, which it doesn't have a lot of good stuff to be said about it. I'll give you, that's a, that's a warning, give you a heads up. Um, or when his church is Laodicea, or when his church is Philadelphia, which is next month, and this is the easiest one of all seven, because it's just a great, great old brotherly love church. Wherever he is, wherever the church is, whatever era we're in, he's, the, he's in the midst, and we're the menorah. We're the light that shines out to the world. And I love the thought that he's always walking among that church as a good priest. He's keeping the lamps trimmed. He's keeping the lamps burning. He's doing what Torah readers of the book of Revelation, what Jewish Christians would have recognized, if you have a man walking among the lampstands, who is that man? So let me just give you a really quick review into the Torah so that you know who the man is. We've been talking about him since we opened. But since this is a book of allegories, it's a book of images and imagery, if you're reading it, trying to figure out what is this lampstand and what is this guy doing, you might have been able to lean back into some of these texts. Look at Exodus 25, 37. Make seven lamps and they shall arrange its lamps so you shall give light in front of it. And I didn't want to read every verse. The light in front of the holy place. And so there was a seven-horned seven horn lampstand we call the menorah. That was to be fashioned and placed in the tabernacle, the light of which was to be the light of the interior of the tabernacle. This is the source of light, by the way, inside the holy place. Uh, the most holy place has only God as its light. There's no lamps in the most holy place. If the fire by day, cloud by night, that's all it gets. But the holy place, the place of where we dwell, where the high priest dwells, lit by the menorah. And so he makes seven lamps for it. Next one from Exodus. You move forward to Exodus 30. Look at seven and eight. Here's the job of the first high priest, Aaron. Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning. When he tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. Tends the lamps. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it. A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. And so here's Jesus in church number one walking among the lampstands. Here's Jesus in church number two, walking among the lampstands, etc., etc. What's he doing? Throughout the generations, he's trimming the candlestick. He's playing the role of high priest. And in case we miss that, here's how John described Jesus in Revelation 1.13. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Who dressed like that? That's the high priest garb. So here's Revelation chapter 1. Jesus is dressed like a high priest. Revelation chapter 2. Jesus is walking in the midst of seven lampstands. Revelation chapter 3. Jesus is still walking in the midst of seven lampstands. No matter what church pops up, Jesus keeps walking in the middle of them. What is that walking? That's trimming the wicks and the lamps inside the holy place. It's Christ being a perpetual high priest for every single church across time. Doesn't matter what culture. Doesn't matter what tongue. Doesn't matter what denomination. The church doesn't exist independent of Christ. No such thing. When people gather together in the name of Jesus, he's trimming the lamp. He's walking amongst the candlesticks. He's trying to get the menorah to serve as the light of the world. And even when we're not about that, he's about that. And I've been involved in church and not been about that. But he's never involved in his church where he's not about that. He's always trimming. He's always doing that work. And so that leads me to this thought. While we mourn over the state of the church, and sometimes we do, in fact, five of seven get rebuked, which means we're probably going to mourn over the church more than we're going to celebrate her. At least that's the math I come up with. If twice out of seven, they got no problems, that means a lot of times there's something to mourn over, something to work on. 
while we mourn over that state, find solace in the fact that Jesus does the work to maintain her. I don't, you don't, pastor doesn't, denominations don't, high church doesn't, low church doesn't, priests don't, popes don't. We don't maintain the wick. We don't maintain the candlestick. That's the high priest job. We shine. That doesn't get us off the hook though, right? Be alert because his work is participatory in that he gives us instructions. He unveils in us and through us what he is doing. The purpose of the letters to the seven churches is to show you, I don't abandon my church. I work on my church. I walk amongst my church, but I'm not always pleased with how she shines. Now I'm the one in charge of making her shine because I'm the high priest. This is Jesus talking. I'm the one in charge of making her shine. But since you are involved in her, since you are part of her, I'm going to tell you what you can do to shine as lights in a darkened world because you're the ones living in the world. You're the ones out there in the system. I'm living through you, but you're living. Here's what I want you to do, and here's what I don't like that you're doing because if you keep going down this road, you're making the whole menorah look bad. Like you're not doing your part to shine and therefore the shining is having to work that much harder. You got, say you got two of the candlesticks doing pretty good and five of them not pulling their weight. It's not as bright as it ought to be. And so the best thing probably we can say is, is that at our best, the church shines brighter than she does when we're at our worst. We probably never shine as bright as we can, but that's our destiny. That's where we're heading in the kingdom. It's his role to fix his church. It's my role to fix my place in that church. I can't fix you and I'm not supposed to. Not my job to look at the Eduardos of the world and say, I can see why the church is messed up. I know what he needs to fix. That's easy. That's low hanging fruit. Doesn't even mean I'm right, but it's easy to do because you can just go to everybody you know in your life and figure out two or three things. If they would do better, boy, we'd all shine brighter. If he'd stop doing that and she'd start doing that, boy, we could fix this thing up real quick. That's simple. That's <laughs> it's easy and it's not your place. But Jesus is letting us know inside the church. There is a role for you to play. There is something you can do. Be on guard. Watch out for it. I'm going to take care of my people, he says. I'm not going to abandon her. I don't care how bad she gets. I'm not going to let the ship go down. I'm going to plug whatever I've got to plug. We're going to fix this and keep it floating. But you're going to move some stuff around. You're going to do your part. Or there's going to be problems, and that's the purpose and the point of everything we've been looking at in this, is to try and land on and try to determine what is it that we do, because he's always doing the work. Listen to how Paul phrased this before we move on in this. Ephesians 3, 20, 21. And so just keep that in mind about him fixing the church, him doing the work. Paul says this, now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Look where the power that's doing it is. It's in us. Whatever's going to happen is going to come from within us. To him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ. To all generations forever and ever. Amen. To him be glory where? In the church by Jesus Christ. So Paul writes essentially the same thing the seven churches are trying to say. And that is... If God's going to do the work, he's going to do it through the power in us. And he's going to give the glory to his father through his church. So it becomes imperative that the church shine as bright as she can possibly shine. And it also becomes imperative that we don't give up on the church. Even when, and I don't mean that you got to support every church. I don't mean that you've got to stay in the church you're in. That's a build. That's a location. That's not the church, but we can't give up on the body of Christ just because, and you go, yeah, but I've tried them all. Well, st stick with Jesus, try Jesus and let community develop around Jesus. But to say that it's all bad because everyone I tried on that street's wrong with I know it's easy to get into that mode. It's so easy. And I go into these meetings all the time. And that's one of the biggest questions I get, believe it or not. One of the most common questions I get in Q&A or in private. Most times in private. People don't want to ask it out loud. But most of the time in private is people saying, I can't find a church. Don't like any of the places I'm going. Can't stand the music. The theology's wrong. Pastors this. The Sunday school program's that. Children's church is this. Don't like this. Don't like that. What should I do? And there's a part of me that goes, I don't know. Maybe lower your expectations. That's what I want to say is, gosh, there's full of humans 
All right, there's gonna be a lot of problems wherever you go. There's gonna be people that sing what you don't like and say stuff you don't like and act the way you don't like, and that's just life. Now, I get that that's not the answer they want because <laughs> we want something else. And so I've, I've, I've worked on this, I've, I've, I've struggled with it, but where I land is, look, you have to do what brings you peace, but don't give up on the body of Christ. All right, whatever that looks like, don't give up on the body because Jesus hasn't given up on the body. If he can walk in the middle of some of these dumpster fires in Revelations 2 and 3, you can surely set through a song you disagree with some theology once in a while. Or you can surely put up with a sermon where you go, boy, I don't know, I found five things I didn't like about that. And you go, well, and, and think about Jesus. He goes, well, I got to go there every week. You know, I got to walk around in that all the time. And I know that's not the answer we always want, but sometimes it's the answer we need. And that is don't give up on the church. And whatever that looks like on your individual basis, that's between you and the Lord. But the answer is not, I'm going to stay away from all of it and just have my own relationship with Jesus. I think that's the wrong approach entirely, is to go forget it. It's me and Jesus got our own thing going. I don't need anybody else. Everybody else just hurts me. And that's you trying to run off to an island so you don't get hurt in a world full of hurt. And you're safe for more than that. And the kingdom doesn't stick its head in the sand and go, well, let the world go to hell. Who cares? I'm already saved. No, the kingdom realizes I'm part of that menorah. Some of my lights are bright and some of my lights aren't bright. And some days I'm in good shape and some days I'm terrible. But he doesn't leave me. He doesn't forsake me. He keeps trimming the wick. He keeps moving me around. He keeps polishing things off. He keeps saying, it's okay. I know it's not a good week. I know it's a bad month. I know it's a terrible season. But come and walk this out with me. Let's add a verse. Revelation chapter 3. As we, as we work through... Just no extra screens here. Just a couple things I want to say as we work. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God, the seven stars. The number seven pops up over and over and over and over and over in the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation is an unveiling. The book of Revelation is apocalypse literature. It's symbolic. It's not literal. Um, let me say that again. It is symbolic. It is not literal. Let me say that for the third time. The book of Revelation is symbolic. It is not literal. And if you are reading the book of Revelation looking for literal events, you do not understand how to read apocalypse. All right, so start there. When he is as a lamb freshly slain, it is not as if Jesus is a sheep in heaven with blood dripping off of him. When a dragon comes out of the sea, it is not as if a real dragon is going to come flying up out of the ocean. When the mark of the beast is on the forehead and the hand, it is not as if a literal tattoo lands on the flesh of human beings by which they can or cannot purchase. You have to understand that it doesn't just say one thing and this is not literal, but then over here this becomes literal and this is not literal and then this is... That's cherry picking the Bible to the place where I can comprehend what might be real and the other stuff I don't know. That doesn't seem so real. And so once you kind of get in that mode, you start to understand it, you realize that all of these things are symbolic. There's not seven holy ghosts, all right? There's no indication in any other passage of the Bible that there's seven spirits, that God has seven different personalities that run around in the heavens. And one of them's the angry God, and one of them's the gracious God, and that all seven are necessary for you to really truly know who God is. But seven is perfection and completion. There's nothing left. And so when God has the seven spirits, there's just simply nothing outside of the Spirit of God in, in that context. And he also told us in a previous passage that those seven spirits were the messengers or the pastors pastors of those churches. And so he's showing us the fullness of leadership. The seven stars could actually be a reference to something that was believed to be fairly common in the first century. Astrology started to take off quite heavily in the first century. And so there was a pretty common belief in the first and second century that one could govern their life by the seven most dominant stars in the heavens. And so it's almost a twist of irony that in Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3, John comes along and goes, you want to know who actually holds those seven stars in his hands? And he makes it to be Jesus, which would have been completely off the charts for, for you to make that connection. And yet John makes it. So it's pretty interesting. And Jesus says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful, strengthen the things which remain. They're ready to die. Look at this. Here is present condition. Here's possible future condition. So you, you have a name that you're alive, but you are dead. You have some other stuff that's okay, but that's ready to die. So you got some stuff you better fix because it's not going to go well for you. And I have not found your works perfect before God. So what can we take? What's happening in this passage? Sardis 
is often called the dead church. But that title tends to lead us to think boring or irrelevant. If you come up in any kind of Pentecostal charismatic movement, someone would, they go to one of those dead churches. What did that mean? That meant they didn't shout, they didn't speak in tongues, they didn't flow in the Holy Ghost. Their services were boring. Um, it was a little bit parochial. It was a lot of choirs and people were holding songbooks. And, they, and, then, and then when you got to be a more progressive liberated Christian, all of those dead people were wearing suits and ties and felt like they had to wear a dress. And, and, but the real, the real power was somewhere else. So get that out of your head. That has nothing to do. That's a, that's a modern understanding of the phrase dead. That leads us to think boring or it leads us to think irrelevant. But Jesus says... That they, and I didn't mean wave, <laughs> that's Paul White typing, they have won a reputation of being alive. Now, it doesn't say that in your English translation, but it says that in your Greek. Where, where Let me reread, and we don't have to put the scripture back up, but I know your works that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. But the Greek there tells us you have one, W-O-N, you won a name that you are alive, but the truth is, is that you are dead. And so that leads me to trying to figure out where they want it from because we know they didn't win that from Jesus. If, he, if they won that reputation from Jesus, then the next few verses doesn't make any sense. He ought to be saying, congratulations, you won a reputation that you're alive. I'm, I'm with you. But he, he downplays that reputation. So if they won it, but they didn't win it from Jesus, well, they must have won it from the world around them, which tells me that if they're dead and there's some stuff that's dying and they've won a reputation that they're alive, but they're really not, then they didn't win that, that, that reputation from Jesus. They must have won it from somewhere else. Then the church at Sardis might represent the church that's active and loud and quote unquote relevant or what I like to call 10 miles wide and one foot deep. Because if you take a look at Sardis, you'll go, wow, that's what we want our church to be. But then if you scratch a little closer at the surface, you realize that there's some stuff covered up in shiny paint. And you go, hmm. And that's what Jesus says to Sardis. He goes, based upon the people around you, you've won a reputation of being something you're not. You've won a reputation of being alive. But I know that really it's a facade. It's not as lively as it appears. And Sardis just might represent the idea of a church. But the idea of whom? Well, according to Jesus, you've won a name that you are alive. If you won it and you didn't win it from Jesus, you won it from someone. And I say, maybe you won it from the world around you or you won the reputation by your actions. But it's not the truth. It's a one reputation, a W-O-N reputation that happens because perhaps we have changed what we view to be a success in the church from where Jesus viewed or deemed or termed a success in the church. The reason I use the phrase 10 miles wide and a foot deep is I just imagine this idea that if you look at Sardis, there's nothing on the surface you wouldn't like. Because if you win the reputation that you are alive, that to win is competitive. You beat everything else out. Like every other version that was presented Sardis wins. So if you go around and poll and go, what kind of church are you looking for? Sardis has got a box for that. What do you hope they do? Sardis has figured out how to check that box. What do you hope they provide? In fact, I kind of feel like Sardis represents the church that does look to check the boxes of relevancy in the world before it looks to see how deep it is in its relationship with the high priest. In fact, is willing to have a shallow pool as long as it's wide enough to look impressive. But then when you get a little closer to Sardis and you start to jump in, you realize it's not a diving pool. You can't go that deep because there's not really a lot there that's going to equip you in your identity, that's going to equip you in your righteousness, that's going to equip you as a citizen first of the kingdom. There's not a lot there that's going to give you security in the midst of your fear, that's going to, that's going to come against the darkness that invades your life. There's flash and there's substance and there's relevance and there's activity and there's volume, but there's just something wrong below the surface. And yet, it's a box checking place because... It's as if we went into the marketplace and went, what would give us the widest footprint? 
And we go, okay, let's do that and 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 let's don't skip any of those and we'll check and check, 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 check until we can make all of them happen. And Jesus says, on the outside, you won. You won the great competition of best church. But I know better, he says, because I'm living in here. I'm walking around every day and I'm polishing the candlestick and I'm re... I'm adding the wax and I'm trimming the wick and I'm looking around going, hmm, water's not as deep as it looks on the outside. What's wrong? Here's the thing that disturbs me the most, honestly, about Sardis. It's not really that the lake's wide, but not deep. Well, at least it's wide. It's pretty, that's a lot of volume. I mean, at least you're covering some ground, right? That's better than covering no ground at all. I can accept that argument. What bugs me the most about Sardis is that when you lay it out for what it is, It's the most enviable church for most of us. It's the one we really wish we could be. Now, I don't mean when we're in our best moments. I mean when we're in our average moments. When we're in our day-to-day moments and we go, if we had to pick one, what are we going to pick? If you could stack them all up next to each other, we'd go, well, Sardis checks the most boxes. I had someone say this to me this week in conversation about the place that they had left. And I'm careful when I hear people talking about the place they leave because people leave for a thousand reasons. And those reasons are not always legit to the place they left. They're legit to the person that left, but they're not always fair to the place they left. And so you gotta take things with a grain of salt because they'll go, well, let me tell you why I left. And then the next few things that come out of their mouth are birthed in pain. Okay, and you just got to know that they're wounded and it doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means there's probably another story if you dug deep enough and went, okay, what was the other side of the story? And then the other side of the story does look different and you go, okay, I get it. But so I took it with a grain of salt and but the, the statement the individual made immediately kind of put a little red flag in my head because I've been wrestling for a month with Sardis. So it was, it was timely. And they said, you know, one of the reasons we left that church said, I think they just wanted to be a mega church. And the little red flag went up in my head. And I wasn't concerned with whether their church really did want to be a mega church or not. Couldn't care less. Don't know where they go. Don't know anything about it. Whatever. What real red flag went up in my heart was, who doesn't? Like, you think the one you find down the street doesn't want to? You think you left the one that does so you can go find those four or five others that don't think that way. The reality is, this isn't to pick on any style, but the reality is is that we do look to grow through the metrics of winning. Grow through the metrics of who has the most, who gets the most, who builds the most, who runs the most, who covers the most ground, which lake is the widest. And in that environment, great things can happen. Please let it be known that Jesus isn't upset with winning But he doesn't like a reputation for having something that isn't there. And that should be what we look for in the body of Christ is not whether or not we check the boxes, but whether or not it's life giving. Hear that life. Can you be life giving with 20,000 people in your church? Of course, this Holy Spirit is not constrained by numbers. What would make the Holy Spirit go, well, this is offensive. There's way too many people here. I don't have this kind of juice. I I mean, I don't know. I I can't bless this many people in one sermon. What are you talking? Why are all these people cramping? No. Does it mean that there's truth when there's five? No. Like the Holy Spirit is suddenly freer to work because he's got more elbow room. There's less people in the room so I can really pour it out. So quantity and lack thereof, I don't, I cannot find in the scripture how that has anything to do with God's ability to move. Whether it's through a small movement or whether it's through a large movement, that's not what Sardis is about. God never uses the the words about quantity or uh, even quality. It's living and dying. It's life and death. And what happens is if you try to win the reputation that you're alive, but you're really dead. The scariest thing about Sardis is that obviously it can be pulled off. The fact that Sardis can exist in the world is scary. It means you can be a place that wins the reputation for being alive, but the message you get from Jesus is, I know better. The life isn't here. And I go, God, I don't want to be that. That doesn't have anything to do with size. That has to do with my attitude about what looks like a win. So what looks like a win? So let me just let me preach about me. I don't care. I don't. I can't preach about other people. 
I've spent a long time in ministry thinking that a win had to do with how many conversions or sign-ups or new members that we got. I've been there. I okay, get done with a meeting and go, how many people came to the altar? That's a win. We would even segment individual wins. How did that segment of the sermon go? Boy, they were really into that. That's a win. How'd that next segment go? Mm, it was a little flat. You got to work on that. You got to pick that delivery up, put a little zinger in there, fix that illustration, tweak that verse a little bit. You re-preach that, and pull that up a notch. You got to win that segment. We're not winning the, we're not winning the, the eight minute to 14 minute segment of the sermon. We have a good opening, flat center, picking it up at the end. Got to win. And I know maybe lay people don't think in that way, but man, you get used to doing speaking, public speaking, and you're, you're judging your own content and all that. You start trying to win those segments. So I, I can't preach about you, but I can preach about me. Or you get to the end of the meeting, how many people come to the altar? That's a win. Did that sermon garner enough response proportional to the amount of people that was in the room? If so, boom, that's a win. And if you get so used to stacking up wins through metrics that don't bring life, you can find yourself a Sardis pretty fast. You go, what, what's the metric that brings life? Well, that's where it gets tricky. That's where, it, honestly, it's where it gets tricky because it's not as easily quantifiable. You know, because what brings life goes to work quietly. Jesus said, the kingdom is like a man that plants a seed in the field and then he goes home and he goes to bed and he goes to sleep and he wakes up the next morning. And that's the whole story. And you go, well, then the kingdom didn't do anything. And that's Jesus' point. He goes, it doesn't look like the kingdom does anything. But if that guy runs outside and digs it up to go, let me see if the crops are growing. You, that doesn't work that way. You can't be a good farmer if you go plant seed, you go to bed, you wake up the next day, you run out there with a spade and turn the soil over and go, well, I don't know, nothing happened. I don't think you understand how this works. Life doesn't happen as fast as you want it to happen. So if you get used to judging life through the metric of quantifiable results, you're going to be disappointed in the kingdom. I, I, I will hear from someone who has never written and then they'll send me a letter. And I, in fact, I had this happen like last month. Pastor Paul, I've never written. I've listened for seven years. I've never missed a sermon. I was just compelled to sit down and tell you what an impact you've had on my life. You read that letter and then they go through this big testimony of everything that happened. And I think, well, thank God they told me. What if five years ago, two years ago, six months ago, I just given up thinking, well, it doesn't work. You know, you're putting seed out there, but it's not changing lives because the reality is, is you don't know. See, you can't quantify life in the same way you can quantify the results that mark checkboxes. And we have to become accustomed to allowing the Holy Spirit to bring life into people in non-quantifiable ways, but in ways that are real, more real. According to Jesus, they're more real than the quantifiable results because Sardis won a reputation for being alive. But when it came to the things that mattered, there was death. So I say, we've kind of replaced the idea of success with a lot of box checking. And Jesus is even walking amongst that church, but we can be better because we can tilt towards the things that bring life. Let's talk about how to fix it. Go, go back to Revelation 3, 2 and 3. Be watchful. Watch what Jesus tells them to do. Considering he just told them, you guys want a reputation for being alive, but you're dead, then this next verse really ought to matter. Be watchful. Strengthen the things that remain, that are ready to die, because I've not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you received and how you heard. Hold fast to it and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. How to fix Sardis. In the next screen. Determine what is important and make it stronger. I'm, I'm using, this is my words using the verses we just read, because Jesus told them what to do. So determine what works, determine what's important, determine the parts that actually have life, find them, find what works, hold on to it, make those things stronger. The focus is not on what's wrong with Sardis. The focus is what can still be saved. Time out right there. 
Very important. Jesus doesn't focus Sardis on all the areas she's fake. He doesn't say, you want a reputation for being alive in this area and this area and this area and this area, but you're really dead in all four of those. He doesn't say that. He just says, you want a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. Here's how you fix it. Hold on to the stuff that matters. Jesus isn't on a rally to go knock over Sardis. Just tear the thing down because it all stinks. That's not his word. In fact, he says, you have some good features. You got some really great qualities. There's some really good stuff. So go back to the beginning of your faith and pay attention. Go back to where you got started in this, when you fell in love with Jesus and you listened to the sound of the Holy Spirit. Go back to that. Pay attention to how you listen. That's a phrase Jesus actually used in that Sardis phrase. Take attention to how you listen, not just to what you listen to, but how you listen to it. Do you listen to it with a critical ear? Do you listen to it to win? Do you listen to it to change? Do you listen to it to have Christ revealed to you? Or in a very natural sense, do we just kind of go along because we've just got one more week to cover and then we go back the next week and do it again. How are we listening? And it's essential, and Jesus says, how you listen is important. And then this one none of us like, but man, is this true. Be in a constant state of repentance. What did he tell Sardis? Repent. What's repent? Matanoia. Change your mindset. Fix this thing up here as we change our mind. Where you never change your mind, you are actively resisting the work of the Holy Spirit. Please see that again. Underline that in your mind. Where you never change your mind, you are actively resisting the work of the Holy Spirit. How do I know? Because transformation, which is his role, you don't transform you, he transforms you. His role is transformation, comes on the back of renewing your mind, that's your role. What'd Paul say? Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what do I do? I change my mind as I pay attention to how I hear. What's he do? He does all the rest of the stuff. He does the, he does the hard work. What I have to do is change my mind. So if you go, well, I never change my mind. I've been, I, I, this is what I believe my whole life. Then my response is probably, you've been resisting the work of the Holy Spirit so long, you don't even know what the Holy Spirit's here to do. And I would bet that you have the Holy Spirit out here pointing out everybody's sin, but never getting you to change your mind because bless God, you don't need to change your mind. You've already transformed to the max, right? Well, no, I'm not perfect yet. Well, then why in the world are you not changing your mind? Really? I mean, honestly, let's walk through that again. Are, are you, oh, you got it all figured out? You, you've grown as far as you can go. Well, no, none of us has got all we can get. Oh, great. So then you're willing to change your mind. How are you not changing your mind about anything? How are you never repenting? And yet, you know you aren't where you need to be. Oh, I'm not as close to the Lord as I need to be. I'm not transformed in the manner I need to be. How would you get started on that if right now you knew you could? How would you get started on growing in Jesus? I mean, you're already reading the Bible. You're already tithing. You're already going to church. You're already fasting. You're already doing the stuff. But you admit you're not where you need to be. How would you get there right now? Boom. What's your answer? How about you start with the thing that you abhor the most? People that change their mind. People that think one thing, then wrestle stuff out, and then come up with a different conclusion. And you go, well, that's people moving backwards. That's people giving up on the faith. That's pe and I think what happens is anytime we see somebody shift in their thinking, we're so accustomed to thinking that's wrong that we stop paying attention to the shift. Because if I paid too close attention to the shift, I might shift. And then if I shifted, I'd be just as lost as that guy is. And the reality is, is that maybe they've transformed the way they think so that true transformation can occur in a way it cannot occur without repentance up here and repentance in here. The message to Sardis is not just you want a reputation to be alive and you're not. The message to Sardis is you got some good qualities, but you better hold on to them. And one of the re things you're going to have to do to hold on to them is change your mind, Sardis. You've got to change the way you think. If you don't change the way you think, you might be a winner in the checkbox category, but you're going to die. Jesus says it frankly. He says, you are already dead and you are going to die. Listen to that double. There are, you have the reputation that you've, You've won a reputation that you're alive, but you are dead. Done deal. Hold on to some stuff that's good. Make them stronger. Repent. Go back to where you need to be. Lest some more stuff die. Sardis, you're on a bad road, man. But you got some good qualities. 
If, you could, if we could change the way we hear and we could begin to repent, begin to repent. Father, there's a lot of things that I need to turn over, that I need to wrestle with. You've, got, you've given us good qualities and we've developed some great qualities. But in some areas, Father, we're only, we're, in some areas we've found more satisfaction having won the reputation that we are alive than in actually being alive. And so, Father, help us to, to transform by renewing our mind. That's our role. Now, remember something that happened in that passage where Jesus told them, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I come upon you. Remember that. That was Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. So Jesus is giving a very stark warning to the church at Sardis. I think this is one of a couple of handfuls of internal indicators inside the book of Revelation that Revelation is most likely a pre AD 70 book. Um, there are a, a lot, by the way, of indicators inside the book of Revelation and a lot of indicators outside the book of Revelation that what you're reading in Revelation is truly John's Olivet Discourse. Um, you could say Revelation is Jesus unveiled, the Gospel of John. Revelation is the Father unveiled, the Gospel of John is sort of the slain lamb veiled. And then you, you watch the slain lamb work in John in a way you don't see in any other gospel. And then boom, the spiritual side of what's really going on behind the heavenlies pops up in the book of Revelation. Um, this isn't an, a segment where I argue for the dating of the book of Revelation, but I do see some connections to the prophetic eschaton of Jesus, his last day speech from Matthew 24, and the relevance of such a speech to a church at Sardis. Here's an example of that Jesus eschatology. Matthew 24, 42. Watch therefore. Notice where we are. Probably the single most important eschatological passage in the Gospels is Matthew 24. Watch therefore, for you do not know, you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And so Jesus is not threatening anyone in Matthew 24 that I'm going to come and slay all of you. But he is, he is showing them to watch because there is an appearance and, it need, and it's going to happen. And I believe it was going to happen within the time frame of those seven churches. And I think that's, I think that's Revelation 3 meeting Matthew 24 in that thief passage, which I also, I also think meets Paul's second, first Thessalonians 5, that he's going to come like a thief. And so I think when you bring those in, you're looking at an end of the world eschatology. And by end of the world, I don't mean end of planet Earth, but an end of the era, the end of the age that they were living in. And I think Sardis is staring down the end of that. And Jesus is saying to them, watch, you don't have a lot of time, Sardis, get this fixed. Now, how does that apply to the church across time? Well, quite possibly what we need to realize is that Jesus is always making appearances in our lives. He's always making a revelatory appearance. And we need to pay attention and hold on to the things that we have because Jesus is making, an, he's making a, a, a parousia, that Greek word for appearing. He's making appearings all of the time within his church. And it's sort of like this. I own this house. This is my property. Take care of it because at any moment I'm going to come and check out what's going on. And I think, we have, I think we've lost a little bit of that in the church. And that's Jesus walking amongst his church going, hey, how's my church doing? Hold on to the stuff you need to hold on to. I'm here. I want to take a look. And I think we need to keep an awareness of that in our mind that if we did, that maybe we would act like we were living in somebody else's house. And that's the church. And we would take her serious. And we would take care of her. And we would realize this part... It's who we are as the body of Christ. All right, let's head towards the close. Revelation chapter 3, verses 4, 5, and 6. You have a few names even in Sardis. Look at this. This is good news. You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's go right into the next one. I want to kind of close this thought. There's always someone 
even in the quote unquote dead church, that's Sardis, who walks in robes of white, who has not been defiled by what Sardis is trying to impress. By, let's not toss aside what we do not understand or approve of without realizing that Jesus walks among it. And then we're gonna make sense of the book, book of life in a second, but let me concentrate on that for a moment. Notice in Sardis there are some people who are walking close to him, they're walking with their robes in white, it's Jesus' way of saying to Sardis, you know why you need to clean it up? Because you got some people in here that really care. You know why you got to get this fixed? Because in every church. Now, this is a message that the Holy Spirit says to me frequently. In every church, Paul, even the one that you pass and go, gosh, that place is dead. Ooh, man, they're in false doctrine. In every one of them, there's somebody in there with their robe white, walking this thing out, trying to find life. Yeah. Just seeking the Lord. Just, just wanting good things for their family and their kids. and They just want peace at night. And they, 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 they don't want to live in misery. And they're trying to avoid the chaos and the discouragements and the hell. And then you, I just drive by and condemn the whole thing. And Jesus is walking around in there polishing off the menorah. And it's rusty and it ain't shining very bright. But he spotted a couple people and they got their robes on. And he's going, you want to know why I care about this place? Because I got some of my kids in here. And they really need me. So don't, don't discount them. Don't throw them out. Don't say they're not worthy because their doctrine doesn't line up with yours. Don't say they don't have it because they ain't figured out something that you think you've got figured out. They're mine. They're my kids. And I love them. And I think if we can get that, if I can get that, well, then it, lets, it, it helps me. It helps me in ways that almost nothing else can help me. Because, you know, I'm, I'm prone, maybe like anybody else, or maybe unlike anybody else, to thinking I've got stuff right and wrestled something out, got it figured out. What really helps me is to take a look into a place that I might call the dead church or the Sardis church or the place that's won the reputation of the secular world as being something, but I know better. They're 10 miles wide and a foot deep. And I go, but even in there, there's, a, there's someone who's walking this out in faith and hope and saying, I believe in this place. I think we could do something great for God. I believe in, in this message. And that's... Hasn't Jesus always been on that side? Hasn't that always been his, his posse? <laughs> Maybe they're minority. Maybe they're the only one. Hasn't that always been the ones Jesus shows up for and goes, I'm going to keep moving in this house, in this place, in this way. We've confused this for so long. It's like, for instance, we'll be in, a, we'll be in an environment where we go, okay, we're going to fast for a week before this revival, and then God's going to move. And so we'll fast for a week, and the revival comes, and we'll have an amazing service, and people are liberated, and we'll get done and go, it's because we fasted. And the reality is, is because Jesus is walking among the menorah, finding the person whose robes in white that showed up full of hell, and he went, I love you. And he's, he's in the middle of this swirl of religious activity where there's all this cacophony of voices crying out to God about the sin of the world and the problems and how we've earned revival. And he moves in and touches this one person. And I'm a firm believer that Jesus was on the path to touch that one person without your week of fasting. Because he's never needed you. Yeah. <laughs> never needed you to do his work. He does his work. Who's the high priest? Who's the guy that walks around, takes care of the menorah? That's Jesus. He's in the middle of his church. He's doing his thing, man. He's right in the middle of it. He didn't need us. What he wants to see is us hold on to the things that matter and strengthen them. He goes, because that's the stuff that matters. Find it. Cultivate it. Hold on to it. That's the important part of it. Now, let's make sense of this book of life, and this is how we will close tonight. Is really... I, I, Sardis moves me. It's a church that moves me because it's so addictive. Sardis is so sparkly and impressive. And it, it, it's, the, it's, it's like the American dream of what it would mean to be successful in church and ministry. And it's why we, particularly in the Western world, love Sardis. We don't like the message Jesus gives it because we don't think that's us. We think that's the dead church across the street. But when we get real serious, sometimes Sardis is us. And, or if it isn't, it's the one we wish we could be. And so we go, mm. so you get down to the depths of it, you go, I don't know if I like Sardis as much, but the truth is, is I, I, I've been infatuated with this church because I don't want to win a reputation of alive. I want to be alive. Right? I don't want to win a reputation. Who am I winning it from? You? 
Oh, but that guy's really close to God. What's that matter? What's the matter? What I won the reputation of hearing from him. I just really want to hear from him. I don't want to win the reputation of hearing from him. I want to hold on to these ears that have figured out how to hear. How does he close the section? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. He who has learned how to listen and repent, then listen and repent. And that's what I want to be. And I think that's what you want to be as well. All right. Book of Life. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. Let's deal with this. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. How many of you have heard this phrase? This young lady come up here and gave her heart to Jesus today. Her name has just been written in the Lamb's book of life. Everyone heard that statement? And as a kid, I was fascinated by that Lamb's book of life. I thought that had to be the coolest thing in heaven. <laughs> this massive book that contained the names written in, and we would say it this way, written in the blood of Jesus. I don't know where we got that, but it was really good theater. <laughs> written in the blood of Jesus is the name. And I would imagine, I did, I'd sit in church and imagine Jesus taking this big old feather pen and dipping it in a bucket of his own blood. Or maybe he'd even dip it. In my real revelatory moments, he'd dip it in his own nail-scarred hand. And he'd reach up there and write that name in. And I'd think, wow, I want to see that book. Because I want to go back. Because it's dated, you know, throughout all history. And I'm going to go back in there. And I'm going to find the date. And I'm going to see what it looked like when he wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Right? I can't actually put into words how important, big, real, and true that theology was to me as a kid. Like a real thing that was the difference in heaven and hell. Now, I don't want to bust your bubble, but a lot of what I just told you is an invention. Okay? A lot of what I just told you is an invention. The phrase book of life is not an invention. Everything else I just told you was an invention. The phrase book of life. Lamb's book of life. Where did it get its origin and what might it have meant? Now... Let's work backwards, shall we? This doesn't take as long as you might think. There's not a ton in the Bible, but there is enough to really pay attention to. Go backwards to Philippians. Paul says this in Philippians 4, 3. I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Okay, that was a good supporting one for, look at that. These good Christian ladies, they had their names written there, so they're good. So go backwards to Jesus with his disciples. This is right after they come back from the, he sends the 70. And they're casting out devils. And he says, behold, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. And he says, I don't want you to rejoice because of this. Luke 10, 20. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And go, oh, look at that, Jesus. Now that is where the theology has a problem already because Jesus isn't able to dip his feather pen and blood and write anybody's name because, uh-oh, he hasn't died on the cross yet. Uh-oh, none of these people said the sinner's prayer. None of these people got saved. All they really did was go out and do what Jesus commissioned them to do. Maybe that's the way you get your name written in heaven. So can you see how the theology already has a couple of roots, a couple of offsprings? You go, where does this come from? We're going to work our way backwards. Here's Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. What people shall be delivered? Everyone who's found written in the book. This is, this is a prophecy that a lot of eschatology will place way out in your future. Um, I tend to believe that this is an eschatology that was placed out in the future of the New Testament, but in the past of the present church. And so I call this the kind of thing that happens at AD 70. And at that time, your people are going to be delivered. Which ones are going to get delivered? Everyone who's found written in the book. So this is pre-Jesus. This is pre-Lamb's Book of Life. But this is a mentality that you had that God knew who was His. Please hear that. God knows who is His. And their way of saying that was, well, God wrote it down in a book. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think they thought God really wrote it down in a book? That God didn't actually know whose was His. He's had a big book that He had to write everybody's name down in so He didn't forget who was His. Or is it possible that when we want to officially put something down that matters, we write it down? Probably so. We want something that matters, we write it down. And so in our understanding for God, to God, about God, is that if something's official, 
We would write it down. God writes it down. We don't think God really wrote it down. But what it means is it's solid. He knows exactly who he's going to deliver because he's got those names written down. Or maybe, and go backwards, it comes from something like Isaiah 4, 3. It shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem... Can you see that Isaiah chapter 4, verse 3 and Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 is actually the same event? It's just that Daniel says their names were written down and Isaiah says they were counted or recorded among the living in Jerusalem. That's the one that get to live on on the holy mountain. That's the Hebrews 12 mountain. So everyone left living gets to live on that mountain. All right, backtrack one more. Exodus 32. Here's Moses and God on the mountain. Yet now, 32, 33, if you will forgive their sin, Moses says, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I'll blot him out of my book. Hmm. This is the first reference, by the way, in the Bible to this whole book business. Now, it's not called the Lamb's book here because nobody would have understood what that meant. Moses says, just count Israel's sin against me, blot me out of your book. He comes up with, he makes that up. So God plays along. Moses is the first person to say it. Just blot me out of your book. And God goes, I don't, it don't work that way. I don't blot you out of my book for what they did. They do it, I'll blot them out. So it's not as if God reveals to Moses this cosmic book. It's Moses who says to God, hey, just wipe my name out. And God goes, I don't do it that way. And so the whole book is birthed as a conversation between Moses and God. And God's response was, I take out who I want to take out. Not I write people in when they get saved, but rather I take out who I want to take out. They're already in there. Now, did you know the Bible ends not with people being rejected? The Bible ends with people being invited. Don't you wish we had, you had heard that somewhere in your life? Because the Bible doesn't end with people being kicked out. The Bible ends with a city that's not yet full. And God saying, come on in. Come on in, come on in, come on in. Now that was a little tag to the church at Sardis that really doesn't have a ton to do with the church at Sardis, but it might get your wheels turning again. And if you need to change your mind a little bit, bless God, change your mind a little bit because that'll lead to some transformation. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness and thank you for your word. You've been here with us every step of this lesson today where we have interfered and pushed you aside. I pray that that falls on deaf ears and that it falls on stony ground and never makes it in. But where we have shined the spotlight on Jesus, where we have encouraged mind change, then Father, let that seed go to work like the kingdom seed. It might not happen quickly. But I know it's going to happen because it's your seed and it's you doing the watering and it's you doing the increasing. And we thank you for what that's going to lead to. In Jesus' name, amen.